Today we're going to be talking about the Bob Rumble Center for the Deaf and some of the wonderful things that that center does. It's located on Bayview and uh, it looks beautiful, it's brand uh, new almost, and everybody would say what a wonderful building, but we can go back many years and talk about its beginnings, and that's what we're going to do right now. I have joining me on the program, seated on my immediate right, the Reverend Bob Rumble, returning to our program. Nice Welcome. to be back. Thank you very much. And seated next to you, Bob, is the grandson, I guess, of the original Connie Smythe, who was very much involved in um, really supporting and financing the venture, and that is Tom Smythe. Welcome to the program. Thank it, you. It wouldn't be there without Connie because Connie brought in the friends and brought credibility and, and made the Miracle on Bayview possible. What in fact got you originally involved in working with the deaf? I was invited, I was in um, athletics and I was invited because of athletics to speak to them and, uh, and they told me that they couldn't get anybody to work with them and it, uh, they told me the situation it was and uh, they said they had this little church, uh, they weren't sure that they had any support but was I interested? Well, I'd been supporting myself with athletics, so I had the finances. I didn't have to worry about the finances. And I went, and it was a good match of their need and my talent, and, uh, and I became their ears and their voice. And uh, it's been a great 28 years. A great relationship ever since, yes. Been good for me anyways. Well, I think it's been very good for the people too. Tom, let's come back to you for a second, your grandfather again. Can you remember his early involvement as Bob relates it? Well, yes, in the, in the early days, he, um, he talked to me a bit about it, and, and as time went on, it became more and more important in his life. He uh, was very impressed with, with Bob. Uh, he wondered if he could really do all the things that he said he wanted to do, and that's why he started slowly. And I think as time went, went along, he became very convinced that mm -hmm. the need really was there and that the vehicle needed to be put in place. The, the money that needed to be raised, how much money, in fact, had to be raised for the center? Well, it changed almost every month. It, mm -hmm. it started out, uh, Bob, you'll, you'll, you'll be better at this than I am, I think. We it started out with f four million plus property. Mm -hmm. When we were finished, it was seven million dollars, including property. And then the property was far more valuable than it did. In fact, again, it was the right place, the right man, and um, Mr. Smythe had served under the former owner in the armed forces, so that there was that kind of a contact. And, and then Mr. Smythe naturally let him have the privilege of contributing as well and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we had a, a lovely facility, the right location. There couldn't have been a better place and obviously it was the right time and at that time when we made the decision, my feelings and inclination was let's build what we can afford and Connie kept on saying let's do it right and do it now. And you know, that was the cheapest dollar we'll ever have. And mm -hmm. uh, if we were to start today, it would be 10, 11, 12 million. That's and, right. Uh, so with that kind of wisdom and that kind of determination and, and that kind of personal conviction that if it should be done, it's cheaper to do the right thing than the wrong thing and let's do it now. And, um, what did you think were important things to put into the building? I mean, here all of a sudden somebody's saying, well, let's make this dream a reality and let's go for the big dream. What sort of things did you say these are vital? Obviously, the church was extremely important. Well, that, that's the cornerstone. Mm -hmm. The Smythe Sanctuary probably is the cornerstone of, of the whole operation. And that provided some of the permanence and the stability that we needed in the past, that we need in the present, and we also need in the future. But all the other things were, what are the gaps that need to be filled? Well, we found out there were so many gaps that when we put it all together, it found out that we were serving the adults, the children, the seniors, the preschool, uh, vocational rehabilitation, recreation, social activities, as well as the sanctuary. So that we were providing a natural home all under one roof to do the kind of thing that at that time the government said, no, you can't do it. But uh, again, mm -hmm. if you have the right contacts and you sit in the lobby in, in the premier's office long enough, and Mr. Smythe would say, it's a stroke of a pen. That's all you need, a stroke of the pen. <laughs> <laughs> Give us the permission. We'll go ahead and do it. And, and finally, they gave us permission to do many things that by their philosophy and by their, their uh, bureaucracy, we were not permitted to do. Uh, the fact is that we were right. The fact is that a lot of other people are imitating it today. Uh, is changing a little of the philosophy. They don't quite understand why it works as well as it does, but it really does work. Probably because the government told you it wouldn't work. <laughs> I hate to say that. I think that. that's it. Yeah. You know, and Tom, you've obviously been around the center. What sort of facilities impress you about it? Well, the whole place. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it grew so much from the beginning. The early concept was, was to be much smaller. And um, I think what really got my grandfather extremely interested in it was that as they put all these pieces together, the different services and the different facilities, it became apparent that if, if they tackled the major project, that it would operate and stand on its own 
and, and would continue to grow and serve the community. So mm -hmm. it, it grew all along the way. That's why the, the fundraising became rather difficult because the budget kept growing. Joining us now on the program is Bob McAllister. Bob, tell me a little bit about your involvement with the center, how you came to be a part of it. I belong to a service club called the Canadian Progress Club. Canadian Progress Club main charity at that time was the Rumble Center and they assist in the funding of the Canadian Progress Club wing for multi-handicapped deaf children. And what happened once you got involved? Just couldn't leave the place alone. <laughs> we had this dream, the club, of, of having a bottle drive and bottle drive is now a reality with the help of Whipper Watson mm -hmm. for the Bob Rumble Center for the Deaf. The disabled unit is something very special. There's nothing else quite like it anywhere in the world and it's primarily deaf plus but it also provides them an opportunity for personal development within the thing and life skills, but we also send children out if they're, we don't want to duplicate any services in the community, but within our own community, we have the McLaughlin Gym, we have our own dining hall with, from uh, Harold Ballard. We have all these what other- What do you call that? I call it Ballard's Ballroom, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and it's a great place. What are some of the things that you've seen taking place at the center, Bob? <clears throat> I enjoy the mouse exercise exercises in the gymnasium uh -huh. with, the, with the daycare kids and the seniors' craft classes and the print shop is very unique. Mm -hmm. uh, we do all our internal letterheads and any printing we need to get done is all done in-house. In so but you also do printing for other people as well? Oh, yes, definitely. What about the workshops? What does that mean to the center? Well, what it means to the center is that we can take a child that had no place to go, a dead end, mm -hmm. and we can give them what we would call work habits. Showing up to work, doing what they're told, not thinking they know better than the boss. And once you establish work habits, it's often easy to find them employment as long as they're willing to do what they're told, be dependable, be reliable, and then they start earning their own income. And then it gives them a, a, a certain amount of pride, independence, choices that they never had before because if you have a little money, you can go and decide what you're going to buy. That's a whole lot better than some institutions saying, this is the color sweater you're going to wear and everything else. Uh, mm -hmm. It gives them a, a sense of personal accomplishment. It opens a door that they never had opened before. It also is a challenge to those uh, on the staff that are working with them because a lot of people come there simply because they have an exposure they have never had anywhere else. So they're guessing while they're educating themselves. and. And some of our youngsters who have become very skilled have gone elsewhere across the country. And we have a contribution to make to other people because we're a training ground as well. That's Not only right. for the deaf that we're serving, but for even the staff that come in. And so the University of Toronto send nurses up to yes. us. And we have youngsters even from Acadia University that come and do their placement with us because there's no place else in Canada like it. In fact, that brings me also to a very good point, and that is the role of the volunteer. Yes. Very important people. What sort of things do they get involved with? Volunteers get involved with, once again, the daycare, setting up some of the programs with the daycare, assisting some of the deaf-blind that are in the seniors' residence, and the adult programs after hours from when they're out of the workshop, entertaining them, uh, taking them shopping, this type of thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who you are. You probably have a skill to offer. You may come into our place and you see something, hey, I can do that. I can help them do that. And you can't help yourself any better than when you're helping somebody else. You know, I remember when I was visiting the centre yeah. and I was getting the grand tour and, and fascinating, wonderful experience um, and really a very personal experience. And I you guess. feel you belong. Yes, I'll you do. I'll bet you anything. You do. And you, and you have a tremendous sense of um, uh, empathy, I yeah. guess, or, or what I'm quite sure what the word is I want. It's a special feeling. It's um, home. Yes, but it's also relating very much to the people mm -hmm. that are in there. But round I went and there were people, they were painting uh, the apartments where people actually live. And, you know, you mentioned something, I think, a little while back, Bob. You said that um, it services not just children, but senior citizens. Every age. And every age group. Every age. Now, how many people, in fact, use the facility, and how many people live in the facility? We have 106 residences, resident people that are living there. Plus, mm -hmm. you never know. It varies. Some weeks we have as many as 1,500. Other weeks we may be as low as three, four, five hundred. 500. Um, partly depends on what else is going on in town. If there are a lot of things going on in town, if other groups are coming in. Also joining us now in the program, and an excuse for frivolity, I think, is Whipper <laughs> Watson. <laughs> Whipper, welcome back to the program. A little while since we've had you on with us. Yeah, glad to be back, Anne. Tell me something. When you saw the work that Bob was doing, I won't just say Bob because I don't want to embarrass you, when the people with Bob, what they were up to, how did it impact you? Did you realize that that sort of thing was going on? Well, Bob and I served on the advisory council for the government for the disabled 
for several years prior to this mm -hmm. and before I, I talked to Mr. Smythe. And uh, I'm very impressed with, uh, uh, with what's happening at the Rumble Center. You know, it's, uh, they're doing things there that uh, are so important within the community, not only in the, the, the community of where the center is, but many outs communities outside of that, many parts of Canada, people are coming to the center. And the beauty of the, the Rumble Center, they never close the door. I want you to meet Marlene, a very special person who lives at the center. You gotta empty all the waste baskets, put them all in the garbage every morning, in all the halls. Does that keep you busy? And, and <coughs> clean all the ladies' washrooms and the various floors and the windows. You forget. You're getting old. You're getting old. I gotta work for Willa and Crick. Vacuuming and sweeping and cleaning. How old are you now? You're 43. You're, you're getting old. But you're smiling and you're happy all the time. Why? Eh? Why, why are you so happy? You're happy? Why? Because you have a home. Marlene, for the first 23 years of her life, was in an Ontario institution. They had no answers. They had tried nothing for her. She was in a, what we call a low-grade cottage, a vegetable bin. She was sent uh, simply because they didn't know what else to do with her and asked us to take a look. We brought her to camp, and after a short period of camp, uh, everybody okay. became very much aware that we could do something. I took her into my own home, then I placed her with a deaf widow. She was there until the widow died, and then I placed her with a, a disabled young lady who was also deaf, and it's strange that lady died too. But in the meanwhile, she's picking up skills, great opportunity. She's not a vegetable. No. And there's another case I want to... She pays to taxes today. Which is terrific. Another person, quickly, the cerebral palsy victim. Well, we deal with a lot of kids. I, I suspect the, the one thing that a lot of people find very fascinating is we took a boy that at seven years of age had never walked, never been out of, out of a cage, blind, deaf, never sat at a table to eat, never used a washroom facility. Today he goes to school, he walks, he can communicate, he's going to live semi-independently, he'll always need help. But if we hadn't had a place to bring him, if there hadn't been a door that was open, there would have been absolutely no future for that kid except a cage for the whole of his life. We have a contribution to make to other people because we're a training ground as well. That's Not only right. for the deaf that we're serving, but for even the staff that come in. And so that the University of Toronto send nurses up to yes. us, and we have youngsters even from Acadia University that come and do their placement with us because there's no place else in Canada like it.